week from Friday, so nine days away. Um, I'll talk about that more later on. Today is the first quiz uh, in the last maybe 15 minutes of class. Um, anybody have any homework questions? So the last stuff we were doing, the problems, the last problems you did were uh, related to strain calculations. Okay, I'm going to take that as a note. So um, last time. <laughs> We talked about strain. Uh, so this time we're going to get into the constitutive relationship. It sounds like a, a a novel by that. What what's that guy's name? Doesn't matter. <laughs> Like the Pelican Brief, the constitutive relationship. Okay, so um, constitutive is like the material's constitution, how how the material is constituted, and um, it describes the relationship between stress and strain. Uh, so relationship. between the Voigt stress and the Voigt strain. Um, so remember that um, we're doing sort of a 3D version of Hooke's law. Um, in physics, Hooke's law said, the force applied by a spring is equal to the spring stiffness times the amount of stretch or compression of the spring. Um, ours is going to look like this. Uh, the strain, the Voigt strain, is equal to a matrix C times the stress, the Voigt stress, or equivalently, um, you know, this is the one we're going to use most of the time because most of the time the stress is the thing we're gonna be able to calculate through other approaches, and then we'll use it to calculate the strain. But you could also do the, take the, <clears throat> excuse me, take the inverse of, uh, of the compliance matrix, multiply it to both sides, and you would get that the Voigt stress is equal to the stiffness matrix times the Voigt strain. Um, so this is called the compliance matrix. And this is called the stiffness matrix. Um, and by the way, on the first day of class, I, I noticed this a couple classes ago that um, I, I wrote up this relationship, but I called this the stiffness matrix. So it, it's not a big deal, but you might want to go back to like the first, it's either, it's probably the second day of class. After, so I did the day where I talked about the syllabus. Um, and then I think it's on the second day. I mean, I was just kind of going through an overview of things and I, I gave you a matrix. Um, that I called the stiffness when it was really the compliance. Um, well, for engineering materials, I've asked this question a couple times before. Uh, do you expect, which of these values do you expect to be high? Compliance values or stiffness values? Stiffness. So, um, yeah, so uh, you can see that the values that I gave you for the, and I called it the stiffness matrix, are going to be really small, so it doesn't make sense that that's the stiffness matrix. Um, okay, so uh, what's the matrix shape of 
the compliance or the stiffness matrix. I'm going to do the compliance. Um, well, and I, I think I've written this before, but let me just get this down here again, where the stiffness matrix is the compliance matrix inverse and vice versa. So, um, and your calculators will do inverses for you. So if you can come up with one of these matrices, then you're good. There's no reason to know the form of the other one. So what do we know about the compliance matrix? Well, what are the sizes of the void stress and the void strain? Yep, so what's the size that you need for the compliance matrix to go from a six by one to a six by one. Yep. So it's a six by six. <clears throat> so that's 36 values. Um, so potentially each one of these 36 values could represent a different property of a material. Um, And that means that in order to come up with a compliance matrix for a material uh, could potentially um, require uh, 36 independent values that represent a material. Um, and depending on what those values are, there could be different tests for all of them, but it's hard to imagine coming up with an easy way if your material is defined by these 36 values. It's hard to imagine all of those being easy things to measure. And so there's the chance here when you look at this for this to be a very difficult thing to measure for a material. Um, for our materials in this class, the 36 values depend on only two independent parameters. And those two parameters are really easy to measure. Um, this is a big deal. Uh, and it's not true for every material. And so I need to be really explicit to you about uh, what it is that makes this possible. And so we'll talk about that some today. Um, but these, right, like not all materials have these 36 values determined by just two parameters that are easy to measure. Um, in this class, it's all we'll care about, but you gotta know why it is that, that we can do that, make that simplification, okay? Two is much better than 36. Um, so here are the two values. Um, the independent parameters are capital E, that's called the Young's modulus, or the modulus of elasticity. Or the stiffness. Uh, so based on the fact that you call this the stiffness, do you expect that number to be big or small? Big, way bigger than one. Um, for metals, um, 
the range is around um, 100 to 200 gigapascals. Okay, so 100 to 200 times 10 to the ninth pascals. Okay. And the other parameter is called Poisson's ratio. It's like poison with two S. Yes, it's a it's a Greek V new, Greek letter new, uh, like a scripty V. Um, and for metals, this has a value um, of usually somewhere around 0 0.3, and it's unitless. Um, you get these two parameters from what's called a tensile test. A test where you put the material in tension. Um, and the way it works is, uh, so you have your sample material, like a long skinny piece of whatever you're testing. And there are clamps on both sides. Um, this Shaded red is the sample material. And you stretch it apart, which obviously takes a very strong machine. Um, MTS is a, a really big company in the Twin Cities. Um, and uh, they started out making these machines. Now they do testing for all sorts of different things, vehicles, all sorts of crazy stuff. But they started out by just making these machines that were, you have to have a lot of precision in, um, well, yeah, you have to have a lot of strength at the same time that you have a lot of precision to do this right. But when you stretch this, you measure two things. Um, well, so first let's talk about how to measure Young's modulus. Um, so to measure the Young's modulus, um, you measure the stress, and I'll call it the XX stress, um, where I'm using a coordinate system with the x-axis that way. And you measure that if you're applying this force F. Okay. Then to measure the x-x stress, you do that as the force divided by the cross-sectional area of the sample. And then you measure the XX strain, which is the deformed length minus the initial length divided by the initial length. 
and then the Young's modulus is the stress divided by the strain. So, um, the, uh, you can see if you multiply this excess stress to both sides, you get an equation that looks a lot like the spring equation, where this E is just the spring constant, but our spring is solid material. Um, and, You can see from looking at how you calculate it that the units are um, units of pressure divided by something unitless. So uh, you end up with stuff in pascals or megapascals or gigapascals. To measure Poisson's ratio, Um, you take a third measurement um, you measure how much uh, one of the sides contracts um, so Uh, let's say measure the side length and it doesn't matter which axis you use um, uh, the side length uh, perpendicular to the loading axis And then from that, you can measure this op axis strain. Um, so uh, this would be like, again, L minus L0 divided by L0. But this time we're measuring, so we're measuring a strain. But this time, if you look at this picture, we're not measuring how much this stretches in this direction to get the strain. We're measuring if you stretch this, how much does it contract in the y direction or in the z direction? Okay. Every time you stretch something, uh, it gets thinner. And every time you compress something, it bulges out. Okay. And that's what we're measuring. How much how much thinner does it get off axis when you stretch it? Yep. Is this just loosely a weird like work theory? Or um it, it does eventually. Um, but not for the region that we care about. So I'll talk about that a little more. Uh, not, and when I say region, I mean, I don't mean the region of the material. I mean, for the, for the uh, types of loads that, we're, that we care about for our calculation. So yeah, I'll talk about that in a second. And now Poisson's ratio is the negative off-axis strain, normal strain, divided by the axial strain. And you can do it in any direction. So I'm going to say it's also equal to uh, EZZ over EXX. And that negative sign is there because um, if it's getting longer, you're stretching it, that's going to make it contract off axis. And if you're compressing it, that's going to make that smaller. Uh, it's going it's to make that negative. Um, and uh, so, yeah, if it, if it contracts this way, it's going to bulge out the other way. 
Okay, so that's what that negative sign does. It makes Poisson's ratio always positive. Um, so the range of possible values. So I said for metals, it's usually somewhere around 0.3. The possible values for Poisson's ratio are 0 to 0.5. So 0 would be um, no off-axis contraction. And 0.5 would be that volume is conserved. So when I say volumes conserved, like imagine a, um, a water balloon, you know, full of water. Um, if you squish it this way, it bulges out this way in a way that conserves the volume because liquid is incompressible. Okay. Well, metals aren't exactly incompressible. If you stretch a metal, it's going to contract a little bit, but not enough for the volume to stay constant. Okay. Um, and if you compress it, same thing. It's going to bulge out, but not enough to keep the volume constant. Uh, you can, there's no material where you stretch it and it contracts so much that, uh, let's see. Um, so if you stretch it, it contracts so much that its volume is decreased. That never happens. Okay. And if you, um, compress it, it'll bulge out, but no material bulges out so much that its volume is increased. Okay, so this is the limit that, uh, that it's incompressible. Um, one sort of interesting thing, uh, one material that uh, has just about exactly zero Poisson's ratio is cork. And uh, if you think about it that way, so if you take a piece of cork and uh, stretch it or compress it, the off-axis side lengths are basically unchanged. And that's a very useful thing if you're taking a piece of cork and a hammer and pounding it into a glass bottle, you know? And so that's why that's a, a useful thing for wine bottles because if you took a piece of metal and set it at the top of a bottle and whacked on it, it would compress down, bulge out to the sides and break the bottle. Um, okay, so once you have these values, the compliance matrix is this, one over E, negative nu over E, negative nu over E, and then three zeros. And then the one over E for the next two rows just keeps moving down the first three values and the, the other of the first three values are replaced by the negative nu over E. So that's the first three of the six rows. And then for the next three rows, all three of them have zeros in the first three columns. And then two times the quantity one plus nu over E. And that non-zero value now keep just moves as you go down the rows So the fifth row has four zeros, and then the quantity two times, uh, two times the quantity one plus nu over E and a zero. And then the last one has five zeros, 
And the last element is two times the quantity one plus mu over e. So notice the individual elements of the compliance matrix are tiny. Um, less than one times uh, 10 to the negative 10 for metals. Yes? The stiffness matrix is the um, inverse of this. Yeah, are you looking at your um, at like the first day notes or whatever? Okay, so that's that's the one that I was saying at the beginning of class. I gave you the wrong name for that. So you should make a note of that in your notes. This is the compliance matrix. If you take the inverse of this, you'll end up with your E's on top and some other changes. But the stiffness matrix has to be giant values. This has to be tiny values. Okay, so I just called it the stiffness when it was the compliance. Uh, the stiffness matrix. So I don't, I don't have it as, um, as values. But you can just put it in your calculator as the compliance, and then have your calculator do the inverse. Yeah. Um, and the units are one over units of pressure, which would be like meters squared over. Uh, over Newtons, or one over Pascals. Yep. So the sort of thing like uh, stiffness matrix is big, compliance matrix is small. Is that one like some sort of type of stiffness matrix? Yeah, that's right. Okay, and so now what we have is, you know, I I said this before. Uh, so now we have that the Voigt strain is equal to the compliance matrix uh, times the Voigt stress. And that's the relationship we're going to use in this class. Here are the four main assumptions that, you know, in a, in a way, that's kind of like the heart of this class is this relationship. Uh, knowing what the stress is, knowing what the strain is, knowing how to go back and forth between them. So here are the four main assumptions in this class, and these will definitely be, not today, but um, these will definitely be questions on quizzes. So keep these in mind. There's, I would say, maybe more than any other bit of information in this class, you need to know what cases, what we're learning is applicable to, you know what I mean? So the four main assumptions in this class. Okay, the first one is small deformations. None of what we're doing applies to big deformations. And so you can think of strain values as less than about one times 10 to the minus four. Uh, and that comes up in a lot of ways, actually. That can mess things up in a bunch of ways. Um, 
one of the ways it can mess things up is it messes up the, the second. So these two are somewhat related. The second assumption is that we have linear elasticity. Um, which is the same thing as saying that materials obey Hooke's law. Um, this is the one that says that the void strain is equal to the compliance matrix times the void stress. Okay, so even if you have small deformations, if you have a material that where that's really far from linear elasticity, if that linear relationship does not model it well, uh, our calculations aren't going to work very well. The third assumption is homogeneous materials. And that just means that in your hunk of material, if you look here and you look here, any two spots have the same material properties. Um, Um, like homogenized milk is milk that's, uh, they take out the blood and the bugs and the, or probably they just blend it up actually. But anyways, they make it all into a, uh, into a single consistency, you know. Um, and the fourth one is that the materials are isotropic. Um, isotropic doesn't talk about two different points, how they compare to each other. It talks about taking measurements at the same point in two different directions. Um, so you have the same material properties in every direction. So if you go back to the compliance matrix that I defined, this compliance matrix only, so this is the form only for isotropic materials. Can you think of a material that you wouldn't expect to be isotropic? Um, let's see. Well, it depends. I mean, like the, the um, result of a chemical reaction, it, it probably, it, that's probably not universally true, but probably sometimes, yeah. But so think about things that, like, think about materials that look different in different directions, you know, like, um, well, like wood, okay? Uh, wood is not usually very well modeled as isotropic because of the direction of the grain. If you apply forces in one direction, it's stiffer than if you apply forces in the other direction. Um, another thing that's, that you can't assume is isotropic is bone. Um, you know, bones are made to support forces along their length. They're not very good at resisting compression on their sides. Um, and so uh, if you're doing calculations with wood or bone or anything else with a grain, um, Another thing that's not very well modeled as isotropic is stuff that comes out of a 3D printer because um, it's laid down layer to layer and there's a different strength if you're going uh, if you're going in the plane of the layers than if you're going out of the plane of the layers. Um, 
Now, some of these ideas can still be used on things that aren't isotropic, uh, but usually you just have to do it sort of direction by direction. You can't use the matrix approach. And I'll talk about that more when we get to specific things. Um, okay, anybody have any questions about the compliance matrix or the, the assumptions for this class? All right, uh, next time, one thing I'm gonna talk about, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is when you do this tensile test. So first you do the tensile test for small deformations. And those are the ones that, uh, where we get the values for E and the Poisson's ratio that we'll use in our later calculations. But then you keep going with the tensile test and you stretch it until you get past the point where there's permanent deformation, okay? And then you keep stretching it. You keep going until it breaks into two separate pieces. And uh, so I'll show you what this looks like as it goes through that linear elastic region that we care about past to where it gets to nonlinear uh, deformations, past that to where it gets to permanent deformations, and then eventually breaks. Okay. All right, so let's do the quiz. <laughs> 